I'm not trying to be rude. They don't have the same ideas. Yeah, I mean, no one has the same ideas. But they have the same kind of cultural ideas. Well, theory X, theory Y doesn't work. Oh, uh, Matt, I had to look those ones up, and those were fascinating. They are? Like, They're real. Because, you're, living, you're living in it. Well, I was reading both of them, and I was like, both of these seem very bad <laughs> for distinctive reasons. They remind me of what they were. I looked them up so that I can't remember. X was the uh, claws in your shoulder. What are you doing? Oh, and then yeah, Y yeah. was the... I came back to the office. Softer, yeah. touchier. Yeah. Type no, of. I have a quiz coming around. Ten questions. We're going to go through it. Uh, I want you to do it privately. Then we're going to go through the answers. Just to establish, you know, how many total experts are already in the room on the subject of finance. And I, I want to gauge what we deliver and what we talk about for where, what your aptitude is and where, where you, what you want to learn. Take, there's 10 questions, take a couple minutes. They have, each have its multiple guests, uh, four possible answers. Take a few minutes and go through one to 10. I think we're gonna have to float home. Thank you. It's a shame I didn't bring the Tercel. Maybe I could have washed you know, back to. Okay. Yeah, insurance claim on your hands. <laughs> Flooding, I'd want you to answer your phone. Say, we prayed for rain. <laughs> Dang it. Get through the tin, put your pen down so I know you're done. Please.
All right, there's a couple more that are not quite finished yet, but let's go ahead and, and let's read through these um, like we do. We'll start with Jake on question number one. If you would read the question, uh, read the four possible answers, and if you want to venture an answer, you can. Uh, if you don't, that's okay. Somebody else can, and I'll tell you what uh, Harvard says about this. Jake. Income statement measures A, profitability, B, assets, liabilities, C, cash, or D, all of the above. I did D. The proper answer to that is the income statements measuring our profitability. Uh, the balance sheet's measuring the assets and liabilities, and your cash flow statement is measuring your cash. Uh, there is some sort of uh, information on <laughs> on all of those three uh, prominent statements, but that's what we're looking for. Income statement is telling us, we, we refer to the income statement when we hear somebody talking about the bottom line. That's from the income statement. That is the bottom line on an income statement. We will see and we'll venture that together. Question two. A sale on credit ends up on the income statement as revenue and as what on the balance sheet? A, accounts receivable, B, long-term assets, C, short-term liability, D, operating cash flow, or A? A, A is the answer that we're looking for. The, a sale on credit means the customer owes you money uh, for something that they purchased, that debt for the customers and assets for the company. Uh, and that appears under accounts receivable on a balance sheet. Uh, number two, the answer is A. Number three. What happens when the company is profitable but collection lacks and maintain its inventory? A, the company is okay because profits are always good cash. B, the company stands a good chance of running out of money. C, the company needs to shift its focus to EB type B. Or D, the cash flow statement will show the bottom line. Of course, uh, you put what? C. C. Um, did you say C or B? C. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Sorry. looking. Sorry. I'm looking for B. Bravo is what I'm looking for. Uh, this one is not fancy words. This is saying you've got a run, good chance of running out of business. If you're not collecting receivables fast, we look at the turns at receivables. How many? Re how many? How many times do your total receivable amount turn over in a year or a period of quarter? Uh, whatever, and we'll be using that as one of our KPIs, our key performance indicators, how fast we're turning, we're collecting the money that's owed us. A lot of times, there's a dollar amount on the receivables that's not real. There's a fake amount. You build somebody something somewhere along the line, they got pissed, they went, to, they, they lit it on fire, told you, I'm never paying you no matter what, and you keep it on your balance sheet because you don't want to write it down. So it stays on your receivables as a receivable, therefore an asset of the company. It's not an asset, it's fake. And, and so as we look at a company, that's one of the first things we look at. How real are the receivables? Are those people really going to pay you? And if they're not, you're going to run out of money. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's, that's a problem. Uh, the cash flow statement bottom line uh, it could be negative or, 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 or positive because cash flow statement has a lot of other information in it. Uh, B is the really the answer that matters a lot. You've got it. You're in trouble. <coughs> Number four. How is gross profit margin calculated? A, COGS, uh, divided by revenue, gross profit, uh, divided by net profit, gross profit, divided by revenue, <coughs> divided by gross profit. I would admit B, Bravo. Okay. Uh, all of those are required of the class, I guess, to <coughs> excuse me, go through. COGS stands for cost of goods sold, right? We're looking for the gross profit is C. It's your gross profit divided by your revenue and expressed as a percentage. You're looking at a margin. Uh, so you, you multiply it by 100 uh, to get that. Number five. Which statement summarizes changes to parts of the balance sheet? Mm -hmm. A, income statement, B, cash flow statement, C, neither of the above, and D, both of the above. D is the safer answer. It's both of the above. Um, and, and most people uh, are never shown what a cash flow statement is, even though cash is what drives your company. And, and I, I have been in accounting classes where the teacher didn't really understand what it was. And so 
you'll, in a few weeks, you'll not be one of those. You'll understand uh, fluently what uh, the, the cash flow statement is. Number six. This is the only one I didn't answer. I'm sorry? This is the only one I didn't answer. Oh. I'll, I'll read it. <laughs> and I don't even know what EBIT is. Okay. Uh, go ahead and read it, and then I'll, okay. I'll tell everybody what it is. It's an important measure in companies because, A, it is free cash flow. B, it subtracts interest and taxes from the net income to get a truer picture of the business. C, it indicates the profitability of a company's operations. D, it is the key measure of earnings before ind indirect costs and taxes. Okay. Let's start with EBIT, what it is. That is a, a, a acronym for earnings before interest and taxes. Uh, we look at at two other EBITs. We look at EBITD and EBITDA. And uh, EBITD stands for earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation. And DA stands for depreciation and amortization. So that's... I'm, you're guessing B, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's go with C. Uh, oh. <laughs> what happens here is you've got you've got a gross profit, but you still have to pay interest expenses on the money you borrow. You still have to pay uh, taxes. <coughs> you have a cost of depreciation because you've got to replace that shaper that's wearing out and the bandsaw that's about crapped out. So you've got you depreciate that so you can afford to replace it and you've got amortization on, on capital assets that you have, like patents that you bought and things like that. So each one of those dings your gross profit but a little bit more until you get left up with the very bottom line. Uh, and so uh, some investors look at EBITDA uh, and EBITDA, uh, and that's the number that they go. And a fair number of your investment instruments, like Yahoo's, it will show you the EBITDA of the company. You don't have to calculate it. They calculate it for you, so you can just look. That kind of shows you, because if, you, if you're profitable, but you're in a tax mess, you still might be going out of business. You know, you, 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 know, you could be in trouble. Number seven. Operating expenses include all of the following except A, advertising costs, B, administrative salaries, C, expense research and development costs, or D, delivery of raw materials. Uh, I guess A. Okay, that's now interestingly enough, advertising cost can be posted to two different ways as a fixed expense or a variable, uh, and it kind of depends on what the program is and, and how it on uh, how it's going. If you if you do a shrink wrap on the boss's truck, that's advertising that gets written off on the advertising budget. That's a fixed cost. Uh, if you get if you pay uh, per click on something, that's variable. So so where it goes on the balance sheet is. Uh, is different in different places. What we're looking for here is salaries is part of the fixed cost uh, and operating expense. The delivery of raw materials is the one that's most variable. D is the answer that we're looking for there. <coughs> Number eight. Owner's equity in a company increases when the company A increases its assets with debt, B decreases its debt by paying up loans with company cash, C increases its profit, D always does, but C increases its profit. Increases its profit. That's what ties the company, the owner's equity. That's that's what gets him a fat paycheck. If the company's more profitable, he can sell it for more, or she can sell it for more. Eight is the answer is C. Nine. The company has more cash to pay when customers pay the bills sooner. Accounts receive receivable increases. Profit increases when retained earnings increase. I guess alpha. Alpha. That's the one we're looking for. Customers pay their bills. The faster customer pays the bill, the, the, the better you off in term, are in terms of profitability. And think of certain, certain businesses. Uh, when does the movie theater get you to pay the bill? Up front. Up front. They don't send you a, an invoice. They get paid right up front. So their, their receivables is very quick tied with their, their expenses at a, at a theater. Now. Um, it, we'll go into that more, but but how the sooner the customer pays, if we can get a customer to pay sooner, you know I've heard bosses of successful businesses in town have a customer offer to pay. You want to give me a check for that? And the boss goes, No, no, we'll bill you. What? 
Are you out of your mind? Because when we got our cash flow in a better position, you think a lot of the vendors would give you a big discount for paying early. A paying huge advantage. For 30 days. Yes. So yeah. That really adds up. We, we used to have common terms in business called 2% uh, net 10. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that if you wait more than 10 days, you've got to pay the full bill. But if you pay in less than 10 days, you can subtract 2.5%. 2.5% right up front is is your banking fee. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's worth doing. All right, we're on question number 10. Which of the following is not part of working capital? A, accounts receivable, B, inventory, C, property, plant, and equipment, D, all of the above, I put A. Okay, the answer we're looking for there, working capital is not the property, the plant, and the equipment. That is... Uh, but accounts receivable is cash available you can borrow against. Uh, you can convert that to cash. Your inventory is part of what's required to do what you do. Uh, but your plant itself is, is a boat anchor as far as, uh, as far as working capital is concerned. And we'll show you how to calculate how much working capital your business needs at some point. We asked this quiz. You've got the right answers on the quiz uh, in a few weeks. You, those will see, seem simple questions to you. These are fundamental, basic things that really every one of our bosses should know. And I would bet that if we asked this quiz to some of our bosses, they would not get 10 out of 10. And that's too bad, because that's how you drive a business. These are, these are the kinds of things that, that we're going to be fluent in. And right now, some of it's foreign. Like, I don't even know what the EBIT stands for, right? And you're in finance all the time. This is a new tool that you'll have to look at. And all of us have those kinds of things. How do you know if somebody doesn't have a chance to walk us through it? Uh, we're going to watch a couple videos uh, and kind of introducing the topic, driving this quiz a little bit further uh, into some of the fundamental things. Remember, the first couple of classes are about knowing our numbers. So before today, you didn't maybe even know there are three primary financial statements, your income statement your balance sheet and your cash flow, your statement of cash flows. And if you've invested and you've gotten a pro forma from a company, they send you a prospectus in the mail, those are in there, but you just look at them and they're a column of numbers. Well, we're gonna look at those column of numbers. Uh, right now, before we do a video, I'll give you an example of what we have on deck. Um, here is Tesla's 10K from December 2021, their current 10K, that is the most current 10K. This is an annual report for Tesla. Uh, if you have stock in Tesla, this is what you get. Uh, it is 117 pages long. It will be on Canvas. I won't hand it out to everybody. But uh, th th this is a form. Uh, it's a form 10K, and it's, and it's in a form so that everybody reports their numbers the same way, in some way that's understandable to the investor market and to uh, the public monies funds. And so we, we can scroll down. There's, there's lots and lots of words about what Tesla does. In fact, here's the thing on solar energy offerings. Well, what do you remember about Tesla? You know, they've got batteries and they've got, you know, they've got uh, charging walls and they've got solar power. Well, that's a division of the company. And there's lots and lots of words that are written on a 10K. And if you want to learn about the company, this is a good place to learn about the company. You can scan through it. You can see headlines, human capital resources, uh, extra available information, risk factors that they're looking at, Tesla looks at. And somewhere along the line, as I continue to scroll, I will come to the financial statement. And a lot of people disregard all this stuff leading up to the financial statements, but don't. Uh, if we're interested in a company and how a company is thinking, uh, they have to tell you how they're thinking. And so this is a, a look at how Tesla is thinking as of nearly a year ago, or a year ago. Uh, and we will, I'm, I'm not there yet, we're not to the financial statements yet, but we are getting to them. All of a sudden we see Revenues, results of operations. And we see cost of revenues and gross margins. The financials are broken up here. 
uh, and we see selling goods, restructured other expenses, interest expenses, what uh, they have. And in this one, it's spread uh, horizontally. So we have uh, 2019, uh, 2020, and 2021. And so we get a trend from over three years, and we can look at any of those line items and see what that trend is doing. We are going to look at Tesla's financials. Here it is. So this is one of the statements. It's a one-page statement. Assets and liabilities. This is a balance sheet. It's in millions of dollars. It shows what their total assets, which has to equal what the total liabilities is, which total assets they're showing on this financial statement in 2021, their total assets, $62 billion. That's a nice nut for a company, right? Uh, that's their balance sheet. This is their consolidated statement of operation. This is an income statement. One page, again, we start at the top, what their total automotive sales are, 2019, 2020, 2021. They went from 19 billion in 2019 to 24 billion in 2020, and 44 billion in 2021. That's a nice jump. That's a very, very nice jump. One would expect their profit to jump accordingly. Well, it does jump, but it doesn't jump exactly accordingly. Uh, they, uh, they doubled their top line. That is called the top line. Uh, their bottom line is after all these earnings before, you know, after the taxes and all that stuff, uh, they're showing a net income uh, in 2019, they lost money. They lost 862 million. Uh, 2020, they made 720 million. 2021, they say they made 5.5 billion. Yeah, we can't see any of the numbers. What's that? Did you say we can't see any of that on there? I'm, I'm sorry, it's I can't. It's too tiny. We can't see any numbers. Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see it. Yeah. You can see Our, numbers. Yeah. Sorry about that. Can you guys see? Is that a little better? That's way better. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I, I thought I was the only one who couldn't read stuff. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one. Who so it. what this is saying? Um, oh, well, these are for when we close up. <laughs> is is their gross profit? Thank you. Is in the middle of the page. It's right here. Four million. I mean, four billion, six point six billion, thirteen point six billion is their gross after the cost of sales is pulled out of it. Then you pull operating expenses, you pull interest, uh, taxes, that kind of stuff. And by the time you pay that stuff, you turn a $4 billion profit into a $862 million loss. So, so to the bottom of the page, the very, this, this net income line right here, uh, that is considered the bottom line. And in Tesla's case, they, they've weighted it then per share of common stock to give you, so every share of stock three years ago lost a dollar. Uh, last year it lost 64 cents. This year every share made $4.90. So uh, this year being 2021. We don't know what 2022 did and we're living in 2023 already. So their, fair, their, their fortunes could have switched, right? They could, they could be upside down again. Uh, but as of this moment in the rearview mirror they weren't. Uh, and then finally we'll have a uh, statement of cash flows. Uh, those are for different. Here we go. Here's a statement of cash flows also over a three year period. And we'll learn how to read these and, and crunch those numbers and we'll use real companies to do that. So I wanted to kind of just give you a glimpse uh, at when you get an annual report or you get a financial statement, you're going to get three sheets of paper for a financial statement. You're going to get an income statement, a balance sheet, and a, or a cash flow, uh, statement of cash flow. And they have different titles on that. That's why I keep, they call it a consolidated statement. Statements, plural, of cash flows, plural. You'll see that with different grammar for this statement. The others are pretty consistent, what they call it. All right. And I have, I have apples I have, uh, that we'll talk about in the class. I have Amazon, some of the others. And if you have a favorite company that you're curious about, uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll take a look at their stuff. Uh, somewhere along here, and as you make investment decisions on your team, um, you'll want to do, you know, some basic research online to your heart's content, uh, whatever it might be. You can contact 
uh, most companies that are, all pub companies that are public have a uh, investor relations department and they answer your phone call. You can call Tesla and talk to investor relations because you're the, you're an investor in their company or you're thinking about being one and they won't necessarily answer every question you ask them, but you can talk to a person. You're not gonna, you may not reach Elon, uh, but you can talk to somebody at the company whose job it is to interface with investors. Uh, so you'll be able to answer questions that you might have about what they say in their financials, about what they're doing next or what they did, uh, and then sometimes we'll refer you to what they've released. Other times they'll talk to you and answer. Uh, so that's kind of what's coming. Right now, how to read, understand financial statements, 11 minute video. I want to watch a couple videos and talk about them a little bit that, uh, that expound on what we've been uh, introducing. Aiden here from Bench Accounting. Today we're going to talk about financial statements, what they are, how to read them, and how to actually get value from them for making real business decisions. Let's start with the definition. Financial statements are reports that summarize important financial information about your business. There are three main types of financial statements, the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. We'll look at what each of these three statements do and how they work together to give you a full picture of your company's financial health. If you need a template for the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement, you can find links to those in the description below. Let's start with the balance sheet. A balance sheet is a snapshot of your business finances as it currently stands. It tells you about the assets you own and liabilities, aka debts that you owe, at a particular point in time. Balance sheets are broken up into three general categories, assets, liabilities, and equity. Here's what it looks like. This one happens to be the balance sheet for Disneyland. Assets are anything valuable that your business owns, including cash, office furniture, inventory, patents, etc. Sometimes they're broken up into current assets and fixed assets, like you see here. Current just means it's cash or cash equivalent, something you can sell quickly. Next, we have liabilities. Liabilities are debts you owe to other people. These can be things like credit card debt, mortgages, and accrued expenses, such as utilities, taxes, or wages owed to employees. Like assets, they're normally split into current liabilities that you owe within the next 12 months and long-term debt beyond 12 months. The last category is equity. Equity is the remaining value of the company after subtracting liabilities from assets. Equity can come in the form of common stocks, like when you buy stock in a company like Apple, or in the form of retained earnings which is the amount of net income left over for your business after you've paid out any dividends to shareholders. Now, here's where the whole balance part of the balance sheet comes in. The value of the asset section will always balance with the liabilities and equity section. That's the balance sheet equation. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. So, you can see on the Disneyland balance sheet the value of the assets is the exact same as the liabilities plus equity. That's how you know they prepared the balance sheet right. That's a quick overview of the balance sheet. Big businesses like banks prepare a balance sheet every day. Small businesses like a brand new Etsy shop might only prepare a balance sheet every three months. It all depends on how many assets are moving in and out of your business. Now. What can you really learn from a balance sheet? Tons of things. For one, you can measure the liquidity of your business with the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. This tells you if you'll be able to pay off your debt in the next 12 months. And there's lots of other useful ratios you can calculate. Somehow I didn't stop the first time, that's just better. So current ratio. Your bank looks at your current ratio. Why they look at your current ratio is because they want to know if you go broke today, can they get their money back? <laughs> you know, they want to know, can they take you to an auction house, sell off your stuff, 
and come out with money. So they're looking at current ratio, which is what your current assets are, that's your short-term stuff, and your current liabilities, and that's your short-term debt. So you know, it's stuff that you intend to pay off quickly. So one way to improve your current ratio would be if I took some current liabilities and moved them from a current liability to a long-term liability. That makes that number smaller, right? That makes the ratio stronger. That makes my bank sweat a little less about me. So what that means is I have to go to somebody that I owe money to short term and get them to defer some of it into long term. Typically short term, you heard them say, is less than one year. Long term debt is more than a year. So we see these credit card companies doing this for individuals say, uh, let's refinance your debt, spread it out over a longer period of time. That effectively does this. It makes you personally a little bit more uh, able to pay your bills because you owe less money short term. Some of it is later on. And so you can do that in a business too. So just by, I still owe the same amount of money. And with interest, it may turn out that I owe more money, but I get it out of this ratio. And that ratio then makes my bank think I'm stronger than when they look at this ratio. And that's the kind of tricks we're gonna talk about. It's not illegal, that's not shady, that's managing your money and moving it to where it's gonna best reflect the best image of the company. Because the, banks often have a number that this current ratio has to meet. And as soon as your number goes, up, goes over that, they call a note due today. Say, we're not gonna loan you money anymore that $180,000 that we did loan you, uh, we're not comfortable with where you're at. Your current ratio is out of whack. We're going to call that no due. You got to pay it. And and don't think banks don't do that. They do do that. They call your note. You have you're out of covenant is what they call that. You're out of the deal that you made with the bank. And so when you go out of covenant, it's serious. Uh, and and you can't stay out of covenant and stay in business. Usually the bank the banking community will close ranks, and you're back to calling your aunt for money or something, you know, you're trying to, trying to make money some other way. But those are the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about, how you improve your ratios. Sometimes you can do it just by moving money in a, from one uh, category to another. Death in the next 12 months. And there's lots of other useful ratios you can calculate using just your balance sheet. Next, let's talk about the income statement. The income statement tells you how much money your business has spent and how much it has earned in a specific period. That lets you calculate your net profit, otherwise known as your bottom line. The reason it's called the bottom line is because net profit is at the bottom of your income statement. Here's what an income statement looks like. This one is from Apple. It has six main sections. Revenue, cost of revenue, gross profit, which is revenue minus cost of revenue, operating expenses, operating income or loss, taxes and other non-operating expenses, and net income. Let's go through what each section means. We'll make it quick. Revenue is how much money you earn, pretty basic. Cost of revenue or cost of goods sold is how much money it costs to make and distribute your product or service. This doesn't include things like the cost of your bookkeeper or the cost of rent. Those are operating costs. Gross profit is your revenue minus cost of revenue. Essentially, how profitable your products and services are. Operating expenses are all the other costs of running a business. Utilities, rent, support staff who aren't making or distributing your products, etc. You can see for Apple, they also include research and development here, since the R&D team isn't exactly making products. They're just doing research that may or may not lead to a new product. Operating expenses are also known as overhead. Operating income or loss is your gross profit minus operating expenses. This shows you how profitable your whole business is, how efficient your business is at making money. You might have a nice gross profit, but you spend way too much on rent and office snacks. So overall, you're losing money. After you calculate your operating income or loss, you need to take into account things that are somewhat out of your control, mainly taxes. After 
you've subtracted taxes from your operating income or loss, you get the bottom line, your net income. That's how much money you walk away with after you've subtracted everything else. The value of the income statement is a little more obvious to most people compared to, say, the value of the balance sheet. It shows you if you're making money, if your business is profitable or not. That is super useful. More than that, it shows you if you're spending too much money producing your products or if you're spending too much money on overhead, the cost of running your business more generally. You'll want to consult your income statement regularly. If you want an income statement of your own, you can click the link in the description where you'll find a simple income statement template of your own created by our expert bookkeepers here at Bench. If you don't want to do your own bookkeeping and make your own income statements, you can check out Bench. We'll do your bookkeeping for you and send you an income statement every month. Now we are going to do that with your eBay account. We're going to keep track of what you're doing. We're going to look at, you know, do you know up front what the the uh, the charges are going to be with eBay? How much shipping? You know, all these expenses that go with just selling a simple item on eBay. When it's all said and done, did you make money? And did you cut your time? You know, did you get paid? Uh, and so we'll be we'll be putting very simple with this pencil and paper. We're not we're not buying software. We're not doing big accounting thing. We're not doing peach tree double entry accounting. Uh, although most accounting needs to be double entry, and I'll explain that later. Uh, but we're going to make our own little balance sheet based on us selling a few items on our uh, eBay account okay, as we go through. The, hopefully, we'll be successful and sell some stuff, right? as we go through the next video. Anyway, on to the last financial statement, your cash flow statement. The cash flow statement tells you how much cash entered and left your business over a particular time period. You might ask, isn't that the same as the income statement? No, the income statement shows you how much you spend and how much you make. The cash flow statements show you what the cash reality of your business is. This is most relevant for businesses that use the accrual basis of accounting. Let's say your income statement says that you made $10,000 in March, but your cash flow statement says that you only made $5,000 in cash. What's going on? Well, it could be that you sent out two invoices to clients for $5,000 each. If you're using the accrual system of accounting, you would record that $10,000 as revenue in March, even though you haven't gotten paid yet. Then, one client pays you, but the other client is late. Your income statement would say $10,000, but your cash flow statement would say $5,000. It's super important to know what the cash situation of your business is. If you don't have cash, you can't pay bills, even if you have accounts receivable money on the way to you. This is what a cash flow statement looks like. This is one from the Toronto Raptors. The cash flow statement has three parts. The first is cash from operating activity. This is all the core business activity, buying stuff and selling stuff. Below that, you see adjustments, things like accounts payable and luxury tax. Taxes aren't from operating activity, but they still come out of our cash, so we subtract it. Accounts payable technically isn't a cash transaction at all. However, on the income statement, it's marked as an expense even though it's money that hasn't been paid out yet. So we add it back into the cash flow statement so we get an accurate picture of how much cash we actually have today. Next is cash flow from investments in your business. So not the regular buying and selling of your core business, but things like equipment, work vehicles, etc. In the case of the Toronto Raptors here, they bought an ice bathtub and a hyperbaric chamber for athletes to recover after games, and they also sold a hyperbaric chamber. The last category is cash from financing activities. This includes money the owner invested in the business, as well as taking out and repaying loans. On the Raptors statement, we see there was an owner's draw, which means the owners withdrew $225,000 from the business. This basically means they paid themselves. If you add all three categories together, you get the total change in cash. If you add the beginning cash to the total change in cash, you get the ending cash. 
And for good measure, you check your ending cash against what your bank account actually says to make sure you added everything up correctly. If you want to create your own cash flow statement, you can download our template in the description below. Just plug in your numbers and you have a basic statement you can use to analyze your cash situation today. That's the... So those are the three main statements that we're going to talk about. There are a few more things from the financial world that we will talk about that help um, uh, talk about where we're at. If we ever want to franchise a business, let's suppose you get a great idea and you want to scale it up. Uh, but to scale it, you've got, you need more operators. You need more people to do it and you're willing to sell them uh, the knowledge to open a Jimmy John's. Because you, you've done well with your Jimmy John's and you want, to, you want to do that. There are laws about what we have to, we have, to have full disclosure in a franchise, uh, in an offering. It's called a blue sky offering. And we have to, we can only offer that to sophisticated investors. That means, and that's a, that's a, that's a category uh, that, that you have to have certain net worth to be uh, authorized as a sophisticated investor. This is a Wall Street rule to keep um, shysters from hornswoggling people that don't know how to read a financial statement and don't, need, don't know how to evaluate whether they ought to invest in your sandwich shop or not. So there are lots of franchise laws and there are specific financial statements, these three and a few others that are in, in franchise offerings that, that are have, have they're related to pro formas, which is guesses about what this franchise might do for you if you bought one. But would it perform the same if you put it in Mesquite in the lobby of Casablanca or you put it in Parowan, uh, off from the freeway exit? You know, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe that, that franchise is worth more in a busy location than it is in a less traveled location. Maybe it's a franchise that you generate most of your revenue from online. So the Parawan location would be okay. So there are certain laws and rules about how we propose or offer a business, and on our side, how we evaluate. So if we're looking at a franchise, there's some more things to look at. I want to take the income statement and bring it to something that I think is practical for all of us. Um, most of our, our companies uh, work for businesses that are privately held. And what that means is I can't go online and look up Wild and Wallbeds and get their financial statement. That's their business. Uh, it's, it's private. Uh, it's private for a reason. That means they don't want to tell you how profitable they are. And, and I think that most of us work for that. Stuart Honig is not going to tell you uh, what their financial statement is. They might cry about it and tell you they're losing money if, they're, you know, uh, if, they, if they want you to feel sorry for them. Uh, or they might... You know, at the Christmas party, see how great they're doing. Or like I don't know. Uh, you, you could have uh, 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 representation, in, but the company is rarely going to print out their, their income statement, post it online, and circulate it to their employees. I think that's a problem. And and I think that that information is of, of critical importance to employees in an organization, whether or not the family or the owner chooses to actually show how much money they're making, that's a personal decision and most owners don't want to do that. But with an income statement, there's another thing you can do. And that is you can show the top line on an income statement one hundred percent. So that's you express every line on an income statement as a percent instead of a, a percent of a hundred instead of a number. Now we can maybe figure out a number. Let's, let's try to do this out loud, out, out loud uh, with, with Wild because we've got, we've got enough opinions here we can kind of come to an agreement. What's a wall bed, bed sell for on average? 5,000. All right, how many do you sell? Uh, 200 a month. 200 a month. So that is about a million dollars a month. I can do that one times 12, about $12 million. So without the family saying so, everybody that works there got an idea about that. The company may do quite a bit more than that, they may do a little bit less than that, but we know somewhere that this 100% is somewhere around $12 million. Now, 
That should stay confidential to this room, by the way. That should be for them to disclose, and we don't know if it's an act or not. Who's an act based on ad, you know, they're kind of a, picking it out of the, the air. But, so, without telling anybody this number, they can operate off of this number. And so, the top line is your, your, your gross sales, right? Your gross revenue, whichever one you want to do. And then the next thing that comes on the income statement was your cost of goods sold. Now, you can itemize your cost of goods sold um, by, by component, by part of a unit, by material. You can, you, this is the stuff that goes into what one wall bed costs, right? And so, it, it, does, does it have a labor number? Yeah. Yeah, labor's part of cost of goods sold. And if I, if I run a, a number here and I say that, that by the time I subtract out my cost of goods sold, I have 48% left. That might be close, that might be far away. I have no idea what that number is. But they could reveal that number without revealing anything confidential about how much money they make. They could reveal the percentage number. And then they could say, guess what? Uh, we, maybe we want to do it and we say, uh, assembly, uh, cutting, staining. I don't know if that's even right departments or right order. But of that, we could have materials is, you know, 15%, labor is 4%. Uh, stain, you know, you can just run this percentages down of your of your costs in percentage, and then I could look at this labor number and say, you know what? That's my department, and and if I could cut our labor costs from four percent to three percent, that means for every dollar or every hundred dollars selling, I've got every hundred dollars that I sell, four dollars is labor in my department. You know, you could, you, could, you could present your financial statement this way to the people in your organization, and they know what piece they are contributing to profitability. So I know that if this number goes up, this number goes down. Right? And, and so I could maybe could have some control over this. My material costs, I don't control materials except for I maybe have some influence on how efficient we use the materials that we have, what scrap we throw away, and maybe I have some influence on our source, who we buy it from. Maybe I can find a supplier that, that will cut us a better deal, have a better quality, better, you know, something. And so I can have some impact on this item and on this item, and I'm not the CFO of the company, I'm just adding these numbers together of what percent they are of the top line. And most, most owners that I've talked to, they're not sensitive about that. They're fine. They'll share that number because it's not, it's not, it doesn't tell you how many shekels they have at the end of the year. It just tells you what percent is being spent by your department. And they're pretty happy about telling you that because we have some control of that. So an income statement can be completely converted to percentages. And then, and then down here, we have fixed costs, right? These are our variables. This is, these are our fixed costs. So if we find out we're paying, you know, rent was in here. So if I could cut a deal to, you know, get better, get better rent terms, that affects our bottom line. If this number goes down, if this number goes down, this number down here goes up. <coughs> profit dollars, right? So, so all of these percentages have an impact on how much money is left at the end of the year. And if we are told what those costs are, then I can be a better player. I can be better scout in the company. I can be better uh, contributor to whether the company is profitable or not. And and with these fixed expenses or the operating expenses, something like you know one of the fixed expenses in a, in a company that's a big one is electricity. You know you don't realize how expensive electricity is until you look at you know four hundred thousand dollars a month at the ice cream plant. You know and you go wow. That's 100 grand a week. <laughs> could we shut the lights off somewhere? <laughs> you know? And could we have some impact on, on, you know, staggered startup time so it's not all draining the grid at once when, every, when the motors turn on? Something like that. By having some idea of what these fixed costs are that the company has to pay for, those are eye openers for, 
for employees a lot of time. They have no idea what the companies had to pay for workers' comp insurance. So for you know, those are fixed costs that are in there, and and so revealing those pieces to the company usually doesn't reveal what their bank account is or what their how much money they're taking out of the company. Now, if you're paying for an airplane and the airplane's in there, then you know you may have somebody that fusses about that and says, well, yeah, we ought to sell sell the airplane," uh, and maybe you should. I don't know. Uh, Comments about that? I, I I don't know how you can go to your company and say, I want to see your income statement in terms of percentages. Just be thinking in that term. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if it gets to the right spot at the right moment in the class, I'll go talk to your company and, and, and have that conversation and say, I think we could get some mileage out of this and some benefits. So let I me know if that's appropriate anywhere. I actually asked uh, the owner to stop sharing the end of year income with the company during the Christmas party. Because he was telling us, hey, you know, this year was pretty good, we made this much money. And then, you know, for weeks afterwards, I was had, having employees come to me, hey, where's my cut? Yeah. You know, we made this much money last year, how come I'm only making this much? Where's my cut? How come my bonus was so small? Um, and that was... This is a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. It, it's, a re it's a real problem. And, I, and the company shows up all of the numbers that you can see end of the year for the next year budget to show you like everything that the owner actually puts in his pocket and just the skirt and thing. Well with a public company you see that. Yeah. You know as long as I wish it was a percentage of the it actually takes. Yeah, that, you know, they just take what's left. <laughs> Some companies. And and you know every company has its personality and I this class I can't address that part, unfortunately. Let's look at a thing with Warren Buffett, uh, 12, 13 minutes and we'll call it a day when we watch this. Uh, have a comment or two about it, uh, but this is kind of... Warren Buffett is one of the richest men in the world. One of the key components to his multi-billionaire success has been his ability to buy companies with a sustainable competitive advantage. Think uh, Coca-Cola, Moody's or Seas Candy. For this video, we are going to see if we can mimic his success on how to make money by learning how to identify companies with such sustainable competitive advantages. More specifically, we are going to learn how to do this by analyzing stock market companies' financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. This is a top five takeaways video of Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements, written by Mary Buffett and David Clark. That's his daughter, by the way. Warren Buffett can't emphasize enough how important it is for an investor to be able to understand these statements. He says that they are the language of business, and even goes as far as saying that if you don't understand them, you have no business investing in individual stocks. But don't worry, digesting financial statements can be a lot of fun. At least Warren Buffett himself thinks so, as he says that other guys read Playboy, I read annual reports. This man has his priorities straight. Takeaway number one, consistency is king. Warren Buffett is notorious for saying that the best holding period for an investment is forever. Here's a quick quiz. Which product do you think is more likely to be popular still in 2050? A, Coca-Cola which has been popular for at least 120 years and has remained basically the same product for the whole duration. B. Snapchat, which has been popular for about seven years. The answer is quite obvious. When Warren Buffett is looking for investments with a sustainable competitive advantage, he wants to see consistency. Consistency in earnings. Consistent low debt. Consistently growing earnings consistently low spending in capital expenditures and R&D, consistent profitability, etc. To look at the last 10 year period is a good start, but as in the case of Coca-Cola, the longer the company has been proving its durability, the better. Selling the same product for many years, such as Coca-Cola has done, has a great advantage for you as the stock owner. It reduces costs by a lot. It reduces production costs as the need to upgrade machinery decreases. It reduces marketing costs as marketing efforts are cumulative. 
It reduces costs for research and development, duh. It lowers the training cost of employees. It reduces the risk of having obsolete inventory. And uh, when costs are reduced by a lot, it means a lot more money in the pockets of shareholders. Not only are the costs reduced in these companies, but you'll be able to experience compound interest tax-free when your holding period is forever, which is something that has made Warren Buffett awfully rich during the last 50 years. Takeaway number two, what Warren Buffett is looking for in an income statement. To illustrate what Buffett looks for, we will use one of his more recent and largest investments, Apple. First and foremost, I will assume that you know some basics about financial statements. If you don't, head over to my summary of The Interpretation of Financial Statements by Benjamin Graham for some Investing 101. Let's start up by having a look at the bottom line to confirm what we talked about in the previous takeaway. The net earnings of the company has shown great consistency over the last 10 years. Fair enough, it doesn't have the track record of Coca-Cola and neither are its products as durable, in my opinion. But the iPhone has looked quite similar since its release in 2007. Moreover, the earnings of Apple have grown at a steady pace. Another thing that Warren Buffett wants to see in his investments is a consistent and high gross margin. As a rule of thumb, you'd want to see a margin of 40% plus. We can see that Apple just makes the cut here. It's always interesting to compare with competitors as well. So um, as a point of reference, Samsung had a gross margin of 45.7% in 2018, and Huawei had a margin of 38.6%. Having a high gross margin typically says something about the scalability of the business, meaning that the more the company sells, the greater the profitability becomes. This is the trait that you'd want to see in any business that you own. Finally, we want to compare the bottom line to the top line and calculate the net margin. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have higher net margins than their competitors. Apple beats both Samsung and Huawei in this regard. And uh, here's another rule of thumb. A net margin of 20% or higher is typically a very strong result, revealing that we are dealing with a smoothly run business. Takeaway number three. What Warren Buffett is looking for in the balance sheet. Next up is the balance sheet. Warren Buffett likes to look at a figure called retained earnings. The figure is being added to or withdrawn from each year depending on if the company is reinvesting its net income or not. Buffett typically likes to see a steady growth here, meaning that the business is profitable and that it identifies good reinvesting opportunities. If we look at Berkshire Hathaway's retained earnings, for example, we see a very strong growth during the last decade. Apple doesn't really fulfill the criterion regarding retained earnings, but one must also take into consideration that uh, starting in 2013, Apple began a quite extensive dividends and share repurchase program. We'll get to this in the next takeaway. To measure how efficient a company is using these reinvested earnings, return on equity can typically be used. To calculate this, we must revisit the income statement and compare the net income to the total equity of the company. Apple is showing a lot of strength in this regard, which is partly an effect of distributing so much of the earnings to shareholders, but also a sign of a business with a durable competitive advantage. As a comparison, Samsung and Huawei aren't even half as profitable. In his 1983 shareholder letter, Warren Buffett suggests a somewhat more sophisticated approach towards measuring how efficient a company is using its capital. He suggests that one should calculate the so-called return on net tangible assets. More on this in the essays of Warren Buffett. A third thing to notice is that the exceptional business seldom requires a lot of debt to expand, banks perhaps being the exception. Because usually, it can just use the strong cash flow from the business. Therefore, look for businesses with little to no long-term debt. If a company can pay off all its long-term debt with less than four years of earnings, it's in quite a good position. Apple clearly fulfills this criteria, 
and its competitors do too. Takeaway number four, what Warren Buffett is looking for in a cash flow statement. Finally, the third financial statement that you must dive into is the cash flow statement. A cash flow statement differs from an income statement in that it represents actual ins and outs of money, while the income statement is a measure of financial performance. Yes, I will probably make a video of its own about this in the future. Comment, uh, I want it, down below if you, well, if you want such a video. For now, it's enough that you know that one important figure is the capital expenditures. This is money being spent on properties, plants and equipment primarily. Look at what percentage capital expenditures are of net earnings. You want them to be as low as possible. Lower than 25% over a period of time is considered very good and less than 50% is acceptable. There are exceptions though, such as when a company is making a one-time payment to grow the business. Look at what the company is using the money for. Apple does very well here. In almost every year, they had capital expenses at less than 25%. The same thing can't be said about its competitors. Also, in the cash flow statement, we can see the reasons why the retained earnings from the balance sheet haven't been growing much since 2012. Apple has been distributing a lot of cash to its shareholders. The so-called augmented payout ratio, which includes share buybacks as well as dividends, has been higher than 100% during some years, which basically means that Apple is distributing more money than it earns. Takeaway number five, when to sell. As I've talked about before, one of Warren Buffett's key concepts on how to invest in stocks successfully is to hold on to your investments forever. Still though, there are three instances when you might consider selling your stock. One, you need more money for an even better investment. At times, perhaps especially in bear markets, there are so many opportunities to go around that you must consider switching from something that is great to something that is exceptional. In 1974, Warren Buffett said this, noting that a lot of stocks were undervalued. I felt like an oversexed guy in a horror. Two, when a company may lose its competitive advantage. Times are changing. For example, the once monopoly-like characteristics of the local newspapers are now being disrupted by online media. If one of your investments face a risk of this kind, it may be time to cut it loose. 3. During crazy bull markets. Even a fantastic business can be a bad investment if you must acquire it at a crazy price. And likewise, there are times when you can improve your personal finances by selling a fantastic business at such a price, if you are already holding on to one. Mary Buffett and David Clark suggest that at a P.E. ratio of 40 or higher, you should start consider selling your stocks, even if you believe in the underlying economics of the company. And that's it. A quick summary. When you are looking for a business with a durable competitive advantage, the key word is consistency. In the income statement, look for consistently growing net earnings and profit margins that consistently beat the competitors. <clears throat> when observing the balance sheet, remember that the superior business has a higher return on capital, that it seldom requires a lot of debt, and that retained earnings typically show a steady growth. In the cash flow statement, you want to make sure that the business is producing money for its shareholders by examining its capital expenditures. Even a fantastic business should be sold if you need money elsewhere, its competitive advantage is at stake, or if the price tag is at a crazy level. There are lots of other takeaways in Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements that I wasn't able to cover in this video. Consider supporting the channel by getting the book from the link down below. Also, I've made a few videos about Warren Buffett's investment. I want to just wrap a couple of things uh, before we go for the day. Uh, let me shut this off so I can get that going up. Uh, just 
So we talked about Berkshire Hathaway. I said it could put the stock is thousands of dollars. Um, here's how much today it is. It, it dropped 0.5% today, but if one share of stock in Berkshire Hathaway is four hundred and seventy three thousand six hundred and sixty six dollars and zero cents. Uh, that's one share. But and so you probably not gonna buy it ten shares, right? <laughs> Four million dollars. But you can buy fractional shares. That's you know that's something that's available on the market today. Uh, while the overall stock market is beat most of us up over the last year-ish, since last January or maybe December, uh, a year ago, December. Uh, his stock, Warren uh, Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, since, I don't have full numbers, but uh, let's see what we're looking at here. It's gone up 14.7% since July 14th, only because that's as far back this chart goes. Uh, and, and, and so banks are paying CDs of less than 1%. So where can you earn 14% on your money today? Uh, in today's market, that's not bad. And, and that's, in, in some markets, that's not great either. But it's not bad. It's better than most market money itself is made, if, if that annualizes, that's, you know, approaching 20% for the year. Uh, and that's a really solid good return. What I wanted to say about income statements, um, and I w I'm not suggesting you buy Berkshire Hathaway stock. Uh, you just saw how he invests, and, and you know the brands that he owns. I mean, Geico Insurance, it seems like that's a profitable company. Uh, R.C. Willie Furniture, you know, Goldhard reacted to them with more Buffett bought them, uh, and uh, uh, they, they've, you know, they've gone around, right? R.C. Willie's in Vegas and Salt Lake, and their trucks go through here uh, in a competitive way. One, one thing that, when you look at the top line of a company, and then you look at the gross profit of the company, or you look at the very bottom line, either one, uh, what, what you have, if you compare <coughs> the trend, if we look at a trend here, and, and uh, uh, if I'm looking at a company annually, I'll look at, at a three-year trend. Uh, if I'm looking at a short-term uh, newer business, I'll look at, at three quarters, so three months, three months, three months uh, trend. And when you, when you graph the top line on that trend and either bottom line before or after taxes, when you graph that on a chart of time and dollars, there are nine possible graphs that you can get. Over time, their profits can be, their revenue can be going up, can be flat, or can be declining. Right? That's, that's the only thing that's going to happen. Their profit can be going up, holding flat, or declining. <coughs> And when you look at one graph with both of them on it, you know, if profit is going up, or if revenue is going up, but the bottom line is going down, what does that tell you? <coughs> they're selling more and more and more, and they're losing more and more and more. They're operating better, right? If, if profit, if, if sales are going up, but profit is holding flat, there's something broken, right? Profit should be going up while sales go up, right? The only possible of the nine graphs that's really good news is if they both are going up. And if, if they're going up in sync with each other, that company is well oiled and got good things going on. Any other graph, you go, something's broken. Well, I can graph my company, right? I don't have to do this as an analyst looking at somebody else's. I can look at mine. The last three months, the last, the last three quarters, what is our top line versus our profitability? What's the graph look like? And we're going to do that in this class because this is the true picture of kind of what's going on. I had a client in St. Louis some years ago in the automotive business, and their numbers, their graph was looking like 
this, and they thought everything was fabulous, and they were just about to hit the wall. So even when the graph looks great, there can be a problem. And what their problem was, they were, they were an exhaust system company that supplied uh, Chevy and Ford both. And uh, that was in the era when uh, the United States was going to dual exhaust. So their sales were going up like crazy because they were converting every new model of car had two exhausts instead of one. So their exhaust system sales were going up, but they were about to hit the wall. And they, as they did hit the wall, that's when I got involved with some other people and looked at it, and I'm going, what, what's wrong here? The numbers look good. So you had to get behind that and find out that what, what was really happening was their competitor was starting to eat their lunch and they didn't see it in the numbers because sales looked like they were growing. All they were doing was getting more mufflers per car, but they were selling less cars. And, and so when you're equipping less cars, their competitor was getting their market share and they didn't know it. And so that doesn't tell you everything but it starts to tell you a whole lot about what your operation is doing. And the, be the worst thing you can do is not know. <laughs> you know, if your eyes are shut and you don't have any idea what your numbers are telling you, you don't know that you're about to have a wreck. I want to know, <laughs> you know, if, if I need to jump off or not, right? And so that's what we're trying to do is get tools to do that uh, for our companies that we're working for, the companies we're going to start. Uh, and over time, the companies that we're going to be involved in. So that's what this course is about. I'm glad you're here. Those that aren't here, uh, if you have some influence on them, uh, ur urging that it would be worth it. I'm going to sell some crap out of their garage on eBay, if nothing else. Uh, that might make somebody happy at home, and uh, we might learn a bunch of stuff in the process. We're done for today. I will see you on Thursday, uh, Tuesday. Uh, if you can, uh, set up your eBay, eBay business. If you have an issue with that, don't be embarrassed. Don't call the principal. Call me. <laughs> uh, text me or call me, and we'll work something out that will be fine. And, and no, nobody will know uh, that you called, and we'll, we'll get it all figured out, okay? So please do that, and if you get a chance, uh, figure out what you're going to sell over the weekend. We'll see you Tuesday.